it's no secret that I love doing jigsaw puzzles. But the truth of the matter is, I don't like being puzzled. Jigsaw puzzles are fun. You work at trying to put the pieces together so you get the big picture. Being puzzled is when you're frustrated because there's no clarity or you can't figure out a certain circumstance and it really frustrates you. Sometimes I think within the life of the church, we see ourselves as people who are puzzled rather than important pieces of a puzzle. In today's message, we look at part of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to try and help resolve that, help uh, bring to light the bigger picture, see the bigger picture, and see that each one of us, like a piece of a puzzle, is an important part of the body of Christ as a whole. With that, we invite you into worship with a time of prayer, followed by the scripture reading and a message. So hear these words of prayer. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you that you have brought together a diverse group of people with diverse gifts and called them your bride, the church, the people of God. We confess, Lord, that at times we are puzzled ourselves because we're not sure how we fit. And so I pray, Lord, that as we look at today's passage and as we consider it throughout the remainder of the week and weeks, perhaps months to follow, that each one of us would see how important and valuable we are as a part of the body of Christ. Help us to clear up being puzzled and see where we fit in the bigger picture. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 27, reading from the New International Version. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker or indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we're treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving it greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What do the following words have in common? House, field, family, priesthood, branches, bride, body. Not an exhaustive list, but they are all metaphors the Bible uses to describe 
the church. A metaphor is a figure of speech that describes an object or an action, or in our case, a group of people, in a way that isn't literally true. We aren't literally a field or a house, but it helps explain an idea. The Bible's filled with metaphors. Each one has a specific nuance and meaning that helps explain a message the author is trying to convey. It's easy, I know, when you, when you read these metaphors to become puzzled, but like any good puzzle, when it's all assembled, and so whether it's all of us using our gifts and coming together, or when a fuller understanding of the metaphor comes together, then we see the big picture. God's grand, glorious portrait of Jesus and his bride, his body at work in this world. In today's text, we come across the metaphor of how we, the people of God, comprise this thing called the church, are indeed the body of Christ in relationship with Jesus and in relationship with one another. It's important for us to to really get this, to get a hold of this. Um, It's so important, in fact, that Paul gives a really long illustration about one body with many parts as a part of his answer to the question posed about spiritual gifts that we looked at last week, specifically why the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the common good, as chapter 12, verse 7 states. Now, the idea of the body as a metaphor for a group of people isn't new. By the time Paul uses this metaphor in Scripture, in the culture of that time, it was commonly being used, but it was being used in a different way. It was typically uh, used to call for social harmony, so there's a, a, a an overlap there, but that's just a really nice way of putting it. In in ancient culture, it was actually often used to urge members of lower or subordinate classes of human society to stay in their lane and not upset the apple cart. It was oppressive. Or at least, don't upset the equilibrium of the body by rebelling against those who are your superiors. But Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, develops the metaphor in an entirely different direction. Now, I want to point this out at the very beginning because it tells us something very important that we already know, but often just need to hear it again and again and again, and that is this. God always does things differently than the world. Sure, there are some overlaps there, but... For the most part, God does things very differently. He sets the captives free. He suggests that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. He suggests that whoever wants to be great must actually be a servant. But when you think about the world, how does the world do it? Well, the captives stay captive and stay oppressed. The last get shafted. And those who would be great need to step on a lot of other people along the way to get where they are, not become servants. That's what the world says. So as we look at this metaphor of the church, we need to see how we are different than every other collection or group of people, no matter how similar some might think we are. God does things differently than the world, and the reality is that God may even do things differently than we anticipate or expect or hope. So let's flesh this out, pardon the pun since we're talking about the body, and see what what I mean. Verse 12 begins with Paul introducing the metaphor and describing the nature of the human body. It's a unit made up of many parts, and though there are many parts, together they form one body. Now, you would expect at the very beginning of our passage in verse 12 uh, for Paul to use that comparison and say, so it is with the church. But that's not the phrase Paul chooses. He says, so it is with Christ. 
And I think for Paul, this is more than just a metaphor he's picking up and using differently than the culture of his time. He wants to show the specific distinctness of the body as being connected to Christ because we participate with Christ in this world. We are his redemptive presence and influence in this world. The church is not merely a human organization. It's not merely a collective of people who happen to be in the same place at the same time any given Sunday. The church is brought into being by the activity of the Holy Spirit, which binds believers into a living union with Jesus Christ. Paul goes on then to try and capture our minds, to cause us to remember the basis of our unity in the body. All of the members of the body in Corinth, just like all of the members of the body in the church here in our time today, um, at the time of conversion, were immersed into the body of the uh, into the body by the Spirit, regardless of age, status, or ethnicity, or any other way that people like to differentiate themselves back then and in our time today. Remember, God does things differently. Whereas the ancient world, and in some places still today, would use this analogy to keep people in their proper places, stay in your lane, and separate based on status or identity or, or whatever it might be, God says, no. Whether slave or free, Jew or Greek, all came into the body equally and in the same way were given the one spirit to drink. Now, what does that mean? Now, some think it refers to the Eucharist, the, the cup we receive at communion. But I tend to think it's, and I would agree with those who would say that this is just really a, a vivid expression of the conviction that the Holy Spirit has been given in overflowing abundance to everyone in the community of faith. Not just some of the people in the community of faith. If you looked at, if you were part of last week's uh, message, whether online or in person, then you heard me describe how chapters 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians are a finely crafted argument that Paul develops in response to the abuse of a particular spiritual gift. So it seemed evident within the context of Corinth, especially, and sometimes still today, that there were those who believed that some had the Spirit or had more of the Spirit, and others did not have the Spirit really at all. Um, and the evidence, the pointing factor, they said, was the manifestation of a certain spiritual gift. Now, contrary to that belief, Paul comes along by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to, to, and makes this statement to tell us that the whole community has been immersed in the Spirit's power and not just a few. And the result is that all have been made one, one body, one family. And it's still true today. We may come from different ethnicities. We may come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. We may come from all kinds of different places. But in Christ, we have been made one. We are a big family. I need you. You need me. We're part of God's great big family. That's what Paul is getting at here. Now, in verses 14 to 20, we read about the reality, or perhaps better put, the necessity of diversity, much like we looked at last week, picking it up, in fact, um, from where we looked at the first 11 verses. Diverse in the sense that we have different gifts and different talents and abilities to offer in service to the Lord. A uniform body is not one that reflects God's creative genius, just like the physical body. If the whole body were an eye, this absurd illustration goes on to say, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, like I say, it's an il illustration of absurdity, right? Well, we need to reflect a diversity in the same way that the body is a unit, but has one part but has many parts, but yet is still one. The body as a unit has many parts, but it's still one. 
Uh, look at verse 18 with me. It says, but God, in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. It's essential for us to have a clear sense of understanding of this issue. God has arranged the parts just as he wanted them to be. Have you ever thought about your place in the context of the body of believers with whom you, you fellowship and have made a commitment? Last week I talked about the idea of fitting together like a puzzle, like pieces of a puzzle. Individually, you can take a puzzle piece and you'll see color, you'll see shape, you'll see outlines of, of some kind of picture. Uh, but together, they create this beautiful grand tapestry, this beautiful picture when it's all assembled and fit together properly. If, as it says, God has arranged the parts as he wanted them to be, then what implication is there for us when we want to tinker with the parts? When we take matters into our own hands and rearrange them the way we would like them to be? Have you ever tried to fit puzzle pieces together that don't actually go together and you try and jam them together? First, it's not pretty because the picture doesn't match. Second, you often do damage to each puzzle piece as you're jamming it into place. It's not a pretty sight. I contend that when we do this in the life of the church, for example, uh, try and rearrange the parts or jam them into places where they don't really fit, then what we're really doing is kind of showing an irreverence to the Lord. And in a sense, kind of telling him, you know what, God, we've got it handled. We know better. Now, I know that there are times when indeed rearrangement needs to happen. But we need to be certain that it's the Lord that's doing the rearranging, not us. Because the Lord places where he wants us to be to help make the local body of believers a complete unit. Many parts, but the one body, the body of Christ. So let me just recap just briefly a few important things to this point. First, notice that God does things differently than the world. In using this metaphor of the body and taking it in a different direction than what was, what was culturally understood in the ancient world and in some places today, God shows how the body reflects diversity and equality. No one part is better than the other. And as we'll see momentarily, the parts we place um, higher value on are lesser, if anything. Second, the Holy Spirit is the, is the one who makes us one. And the whole community has free access to the power of the Spirit in overflowing abundance, not just some of the members of the, of the community of faith. And third, God arranges the parts. We need to see our place in the body as being essential to the overall health of the body because God has placed us in the body to make it complete in its diversity. I, I'm harping on the point of diversity for a reason. Uh, I don't want us to fall into the trap that, that uh, we're seeing in our, our society and our culture as a whole uh, about the trap and and faults and foibles of, of, of being a homogenous unit, you know, one style, one look, one ethnicity, one generation, that kind of thing. Sometimes churches end up being like that as well. The body of Christ must be diverse, and in our case, it, every generation uh, putting aside its own wants and likes and preferences and looking out for other generations and ways it can bless other generations, using the gifts that God has given them freely to do so. One generation calling out to another and declaring the goodness of the Lord, as the scripture says. For me, healthy churches are, are ones that represent a variety of generations with a moderate sense of equality. We need to focus on ways to make sure that that's happening. That if there are missing elements to, to, to reflect, not only on why those elements are missing, but on what it is that God is calling us to, to replace those missing elements. And he's given us the gifting to do it. Now, as this passage moves into verses 21 to 26, the shift uh, it focuses just, just slightly. 
not, not largely, but slightly. Whereas the previous verses focused on the necessity of diversity, these verses, verses 21 to 26, focus on the interdependence of the members of the body, the mutuality, the working together part. So there is the necessity of diversity, but diversity doesn't mean that we're not connected. In fact, there is also the necessity of interdependence. No one is more important than the other. We all work together. There is, if anything, actually, there's a role reversal that's described in verses 21 to 26. Where, as I said, whereas the world places a higher value on certain gifts or positions, the upfront presentable parts, to use the metaphor of the body as Paul does, in God's economy, it's the people behind the scenes the ones that seem weaker or less honorable, they're the ones that God says have higher value. In the body of Christ, seemingly insignificant parts are urgently needed. As Paul reminds us, the, he says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. God does things differently. The late Ray Stedman uh, once met a doctor who asked him, if he knew what was the most important part of the body that allowed him to stand up and preach every Sunday. Stedman was stumped. He said, I don't know. Is it my tongue? Is it my brain? Is it my heart? He said, no. Those are obvious. The most important part of your body that allows you to stand up and preach every given Sunday is your big toe. Did you know that if you didn't have your great toe, your big toe, each foot would, on each foot, then it would be hard to stand up and even preach. It's the toe that has the ability to sense when your body begins to lean or shift or get out of balance or fall, and it immediately strengthens you so that you can stand up. In fact, uh, the big toe absorbs 40% of the force when performing any activity. It's a very important part. I had no idea how important my big toe was for standing up and preaching. But it is an essential part of my ministry. Can you live without a big toe? Yes. You can adjust. You can adapt. But things will be very different. Most likely your, your gait will be slow and choppy. So the loss of a part, one seemingly insignificant part like your big toe, is massive and hinders the body from being the fullest it should be. So let me just ask you, do we really need each other? Are we a great big family? The answer, it seems, in these verses is a resounding yes. Whether we are the upfront presentable pieces of the puzzle or whether we are the behind the scenes parts of the body. Look at what verses 24 and 25 uh, say to us. Partway through verse 24, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Because God has arranged the parts of the body as he determined, and in a way that functions as an interdependent organism in which diversity is essential, the differences that we have, if anything, should lead us to care for one another, not create division. It is possible in that phrase that Paul is actually reflecting back to chapter 11 when speaking of the Lord's Supper and the negative part, the harm that they were doing when those who had plenty were eating and getting drunk while those who did not have anything were going without. Paul takes this metaphor and links it with the key the theme that runs throughout the entire letter, his appeal for unity. You know why I think he focuses so hard on unity? Because, and it's been my personal experience, human beings have a tendency to lean toward criticism, grumbling, 
and division rather than on encouragement, edification, and coming together, even in the church. It says that, in a sense, God has mixed us all together for a reason. In fact, I've been using the metaphor of the puzzle. Uh, one could even use the metaphor of a really good recipe. You know, add a pinch of salt to your recipe to enhance flavor. You want to ruin the recipe? Add a whole boatload of salt. Salt's good, right? Nothing wrong with salt. But if you have too much salt in a recipe, or if you try and substitute uh, sugar and, and in place put salt, you're not going to have a good recipe, right? Any of those who cook or bake, you understand where I'm going with this. Um, our, our differences according to verse 25, should create within us a climate of care and equal concern rather than allow us to become a, a, a den of dissension and division. When we try and substitute what God has put together with other things, or we try and focus too much on one area, one one gift or one type of, uh, of one generation or one type of ministry and, and one style of gifting, that's when I think we miss the point of what God is up to in our world. It's, it's kind of like this. Here's another, another question for you to consider. Uh, do you, are you your brother or sister's keeper? The answer is yes. We, all of us, not just some of us, not just the pastor, not just the leadership, deacons, whatever it might be, we all must look out for one another. Again, that equal care and concern. We need to have equal care and concern for, for one another. That's a true family of God. That's the body of Christ at work. Verse 26 gives us a small application of, of what, that looks, what that's like. It says this, If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. We're all mixed together. When we suffer, we suffer collectively. When we celebrate, we celebrate collectively as a body. Unity brings this about. But you might be wondering, like, how, how can this happen when sometimes you know, we're, we're just so very different? We have different likes, we have different needs, we have different wants, we have different ideas, we have different hopes, those kinds of things. How can this come together? Well, let me illustrate it. A number of years back, there were two grad students who were presenting a paper, presenting their findings before the American Psychological Association. They did a study on um, the, how members of the various sections of 11 major symphony orchestras uh, perceived each other. The study said this, the percussionists were viewed as insensitive, unintelligent, and hard of hearing, yet fun-loving. String players were seen as arrogant, stuffy, and unathletic. The orchestra members overwhelmingly chose loud as the primary adjective to describe the brass players. Woodwind players seem to be held in the highest esteem, described as quiet and meticulous, though a bit egotistical. I mean, interesting findings, to say the least. With such widely divergent personalities and perceptions, how could an orchestra ever come together to make such wonderful music? And the answer is simple. Regardless of how those musicians viewed each other, they subordinate their feelings and biases to the leadership of the conductor. Under his guidance, they play beautiful music. Verse 27 closes with these words. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Back in verse 12, I pointed out that the way that Paul writes, you might have expected him to say, so it is with the church, as he compared it to the physical body. But instead he says, so it is with Christ. Here we have a repetition of that emphasis. You are the body of Christ and everyone has a part. Verses 12 and 27 form kind of what's called an inclusio, a literary device that acts like parentheses and says, everything in between is all related to each other. We started with a focus on, on the physical body and closed with it as well as, it, as, as 
and how that reflects the body of Christ. You see, the only reason we, this body, any body of Christ, any church, the only reason that we can, we call the church the body and it can actually function as such within is because of the diversity that God has put together and because Christ is the conductor, the head, the body, head of the body. Without Christ, we really are simply another social club that just gathers on any given Sunday or an interest group. With Christ, we can function with precise beauty that, has, that is definitely otherworldly. Diverse as we are, we can play beautiful music when we collectively subordinate or submit to the conductor, the true head of this body, which is none other than Jesus Christ. It's because of Him that we can come together and be the body and be family. And yes, my friends, we really need each other. So don't be puzzled. Find where you fit. Because I assure you, God has placed you where he wants you to be so that the body of Christ can flourish. Look for ways of living out this passage to the praise of his glory. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for the reminder that we are part of the body of Christ. We may have different gifts, different talents, different different abilities, some up front, some behind the scenes, but each one is valuable. Help each of us to find how we fit into the bigger picture so that together, collectively, we can display your image for the world to see. In Jesus' name, amen.